Starship's fourth flight test is just around the corner. Ship 29 and Booster 11 are undergoing final preparations. Elon Musk has outlined flight four milestones and groundbreaking plans to enhance Starship's performance through ingenious design upgrades. Additionally, plans for Starship and booster recovery and reuse are on the horizon. But the excitement doesn't stop there, Starship 30 has already begun receiving its Raptors, hinting at an imminent static fire test. Join us as we uncover these latest developments. Preparations for Starship's fourth integrated flight test are in the final stages. Super Heavy Booster 11, after completing its powerful full duration 33 engine static fire test, returned to the production site last Sunday night. Upon arrival, the booster was moved inside the mega bay and subsequently lifted and placed atop a processing stand inside the building. The booster will undergo inspections, checkouts, and assembly verifications inside the mega bay in the upcoming days to ensure all systems are in optimal condition. Booster 11's partner, Starship 29, is undergoing heat tile replacements inside the high bay. Tiles were removed from several locations, especially those expected to experience the highest vibration during liftoff and maximum re-entry heating. This action is likely influenced by insights from Flight 3 data. Ship 29 now requires new tiles with improved adhesives to ensure they remain securely attached throughout all phases of Flight 4. Once Ship 29 and Booster 11 are ready, they will be rolled out to the launch site for the full-stack wet dress rehearsal. A successful wet dress rehearsal will set the stage for the fourth integrated flight test. As per CEO Elon Musk, SpaceX is targeting May for IFT4. However, the investigation into the Flight 3 mishap is still ongoing, and SpaceX will only receive a modified launch license once the investigation is complete and all required corrective actions are implemented. Given that Flight 3 was nearly successful, we can hope that the investigation will not uncover any major issues that could significantly delay the next launch. After Booster 11 departed the launch site, teams resumed work on the orbital launch mount and launch tower arms. Extensive welding activity has been observed in recent days. Components were removed from the launch mount for replacement, and upgrades are underway for the booster quick disconnect mechanism. Let's hope that the launch pad will be prepared for the wet dress rehearsal without significant delays. Meanwhile, engine installation has commenced for Starship 30 at the build site. Raptor center and outer vacuum-optimized engines were spotted moving into Mega Bay 2 the past week. They are being installed on the ship one by one with the help of a new engine installation stand. Equipped with a lifting platform, this stand streamlines the engine installation process. Soon, Ship 30 will be ready for static fire testing. Elon Musk has been publicly discussing his ambitious vision for Mars colonization for nearly eight years, starting with a speech he delivered in September 2016. Recently, at Starbase, Musk provided an updated presentation on his concept of making life multiplanetary. The presentation was brimming with details about the future of the Starship rocket, outlining planned upgrades, strategies for rocketry use, and efforts to increase launch frequency by establishing multiple launch sites. Let's explore the most significant and exhilarating revelations from the presentation. Musk began by outlining the goals and milestones for Flight 4. IFT-4 will mirror the Flight 3 mission profile, and Ship 29 is expected to survive re-entry and splash down in the Indian Ocean. Booster 11 will execute a simulated landing in the Gulf of Mexico, maneuvering as if it was aiming to be caught by the launch tower arms. The booster will act as if there were a virtual tower out in the ocean. If this maneuver is successful, SpaceX intends to attempt catching the booster as early as Flight 5. The presentation unveiled an updated animation of the catching maneuver, providing more intricate details than the previous version. The booster will descend at a steep angle, stabilized and decelerated by grid fins and chines. A landing burn will further slow down the booster, with engine gimballing to maneuver the vehicle between the tower arms. The arms will close in, and eventually, the booster will land on it. It is a highly risky maneuver, as one wrong move could result in a catastrophic accident that destroys the tower and the launch site. Musk said the odds of catching the booster with the launch tower this year are 80 to 90 percent. Recovering the ships poses a significant challenge for SpaceX, particularly due to their higher re-entry velocity compared to the booster. SpaceX have to successfully execute multiple targeted powered descents to a specific location in the ocean before attempting a tower catch. During the third flight, SpaceX tested out the propellant transfer between Ship 28's main and header tanks. Musk said that next year they will attempt a ship-to-ship -ship fuel transfer. Several such fuel transfer demos will give NASA and SpaceX enough data to improve propellant transfer technology. The technology is crucial for the agency's Artemis missions, as without refueling, Starship can't reach the moon with any meaningful payload.
As per Musk's estimate, Starship would only need five to six refueling flights to transport a 200-ton payload to the moon or Mars. You'll need about, about five or six uh, refilling missions for every one mission that goes to Mars. So roughly five to one. To meet the launch demands for Moon and Mars missions, SpaceX plans to have four operational orbital launch towers by the end of the next year. Alongside the second tower at Starbase, construction of which is slated to begin soon, SpaceX will erect two additional towers at Cape Canaveral. The first tower, located at Launch Complex 39A, is anticipated to be operational approximately a year from now. For the second tower, SpaceX is considering either repurposing SLC-37 or constructing a new pad designated as SLC-50. Musk's latest presentation gave us a glimpse inside the Star Factory, where parts of the future ships and boosters will be manufactured. At least six more complete ships and boosters will be manufactured this year at Starbase. These upcoming ships, starting with serial number 33, will mark the advent of the second-generation Starship prototypes. The current iteration boasts the capability to transport 40 to 50 tons to orbit while maintaining full reusability. However, with Starship V2, SpaceX aims to double the payload capacity to 100 tons, and future V3 variants are projected to surpass 200 tons in orbit. Achieving such high payload capacity entails numerous upgrades and modifications to the vehicle. The V2 prototypes are expected to be 1.8 meters taller than the current generation, meanwhile, V3s will be 19.5 meters taller. This increase in height will extend both the propellant tanks and payload bay volume, enabling the transportation of more payloads. Both the forward and aft flaps will be redesigned in future iterations, providing a larger surface area for enhanced control during re-entry. Additional heat tiles, particularly at the front of the aft, will be integrated into future ship designs. Version 3 ships will also feature three additional vacuum-optimized engines, bringing the total number of engines to nine. Super Heavy Booster will also get a significant upgrade as Starship program evolves. The render showcased in the presentation indicates that the hot stage ring will undergo a design overhaul, resembling the staging mechanism used in Russian Soyuz or Proton rockets. This redesign, incorporating struts rather than a full ring with openings, will save mass while providing additional escape routes for exhaust gases. The grid fins are set to undergo a slight downward relocation and lengthening, enhancing their control over the booster during re-entry. As per the render, the grid fins will be positioned 90 degrees apart, a departure from their current uneven spacing. Compared to the current generation, version 2 boosters will increase in height by 1.3 meters, while third generation boosters will soar 9.2 meters taller. Ultimately, the final Starship V3 vehicle will reach a towering height of 150 meters, representing a 23% increase over the current model. Along with the launch vehicles, Raptor engine will also evolve in the future. The current generation Raptor V2s are much simplified compared to the first generation engines. The next generation V3 engines will undergo further simplification, with much of the plumbing either removed or integrated into the system. The engine cooling channels will also receive upgrades over time. But a lot of the complexity is hidden because we have integral cooling channels uh, in, in many parts of the engine that, that don't exist in Raptor 2. Um, but that is actually what Raptor 3 would look like. It looks like, Raptor 3 looks like it's missing a bunch of parts, uh, but actually those parts have either been deleted or they've been integrated into the system, and like I said, with integral cooling channels. Um, and where, where you need secondary plumbing, the secondary plumbing has also been integrated uh, into the pump and into the chamber jacket. And um... SpaceX anticipates that with the implementation of all these design upgrades, the risk of in-flight engine explosions will be significantly reduced. Consequently, they are considering removing the engine shielding, a move aimed that will decrease the overall mass of the launch vehicle. Compared to V2 engines, the thrust of third-generation Raptors at sea level will increase by 50 tons of force, while the vacuum version gets 48 tons of force improvement. There's a big chance that SpaceX might integrate Raptor V3 engines into the V2 Starship. Raptor V3 will be followed by V4, which, according to Musk, will be able to generate 330 tons of force. Eventually, Raptor performance improvements will increase the super heavy thrust beyond 10,000 tons at liftoff, nearly tripling the power of the Saturn V. SpaceX anticipates the launch cost of Starship to range between $2 and $3 million, significantly reducing the cost per kilogram to orbit, compared to other heavy lift rockets. Musk and SpaceX hope that Starship will one day open the door for Mars colonization, aiming for a population of about 1 million people on the Red Planet. 
This will require an extraordinary number of Starship launches, potentially reaching nearly 10 per day during optimal launch windows occurring every 26 months. Do you think SpaceX can colonize Mars and make life multiplanetary within the next few decades? Share your thoughts in the comments section. Now, let's discuss some of the latest updates from the world of science and technology. In a historic send-off, United Launch Alliance successfully launched a classified spy satellite aboard the final flight of the Delta IV Heavy rocket. The Delta IV Heavy, with three Common Core boosters strapped together, lifted off from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station on Tuesday, April 9. It was the 16th and final mission of the heavy lift rocket since its debut in December 2004. The mission, dubbed NROL-70, originally set to launch on March 28, faced a last-minute scrub due to issues with the nitrogen distribution system. The system is responsible for supplying gaseous nitrogen necessary for purging parts inside the rocket before launch, reducing the risk of a fire or explosion during the countdown. After fixing issues with the system, ULA awaited the next available launch window for the mission, which occurred on April 9. The initial phase of NROL-70 was completed in under seven minutes following liftoff on Tuesday. The outer boosters of the rocket separated about four minutes after liftoff, followed by the separation of the second stage about two minutes later. At the request of the National Reconnaissance Office, ULA ended the webcast nearly seven minutes into the flight after the nose fairing was jettisoned. Six hours later, the rocket's upper stage deployed the satellite into a circular geostationary orbit nearly 36,000 kilometers over the equator. The legacy of the Delta family of launch vehicles stretches back to the early stages of the space age, with the inaugural Delta rocket launch occurring in 1960. Over the following decades, Delta rockets became synonymous with spaceflight, playing pivotal roles in deploying numerous communications satellites, launching the first generation of GPS navigation satellites, and facilitating NASA's initial rover missions to Mars. Please watch my previous video for a comprehensive and detailed history of the Delta rockets. Link in the description. SpaceX successfully launched the first in a new line of dedicated rideshare missions, dubbed Bandwagon, from Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 39A on April 7. The mission carried 11 spacecraft from six customers, with the largest being the 425 Project Satellite for South Korea. The 425 Project is a constellation of South Korean military Earth observation satellites. The first satellite of the constellation was launched on a Falcon 9 in December 2023. Three more satellites are scheduled for launch in the forthcoming years to complete the constellation. Capella Space launched the Acadia 4 Synthetic Aperture Radar Satellite on Bandwagon 1. The Acadia satellites are designed to expand the existing Capella constellation, providing the highest quality imagery, the best ground range resolution, and the fastest order to delivery speeds available from any commercial SAR provider. Hawkeye 360 deployed six of its radio frequency geolocation microsatellites, augmenting the 21 satellites already in orbit. These microsatellites will operate collectively to pinpoint the origins of radio frequency transmissions on Earth, providing vital data for applications such as maritime domain awareness, spectrum management, and defense intelligence. Other payloads on Bandwagon 1 are the Tsukiyomi 2 Earth observation satellite from Japanese satellite manufacturer and operator IQPS. Fleet Space's Centauri 6 satellite for Internet of Things services, and TSAT 1A, India's military grade geospatial satellite. SpaceX ended its webcast early on the mission at the request of South Korea to maintain the confidentiality of its military satellite on board. As per reports, all satellites were successfully deployed into a 590 km orbit inclined at 45.4 degrees to the equator. SpaceX announced the bandwagon missions last August, aimed at launching satellites into mid-inclination orbits, ranging from 550 to 605 kilometers. According to SpaceX, mid-inclination orbits are the second most commonly demanded orbits among rideshare customers, after sun-synchronous orbits. The cost of launch for the bandwagon missions is set at $5,500 per kilogram, with a yearly price escalation of $500 per kilogram. The bandwagon missions are different from SpaceX's transporter rideshare missions, as they focus on mid-inclination orbits, while the transporter missions primarily target sun-synchronous orbits. SpaceX says it continues to see strong interest in its transporter and bandwagon rideshare missions. The company's website presently outlines three transporter flights annually through 2027, and anticipates four additional bandwagon flights before 2025 concludes. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.